Here's a really strange thing. Walter White, the character from Breaking Bad, and Jesus have something major in common. And this strange comparison can help us understand how the Bible can shape contemporary ethics in healthy ways. For example, take a still ongoing debate within some churches. Some continue to debate, shockingly in my opinion, can women be leaders of churches given that they're women? <laughs> what? Hmm. One would think this would not be a debate at this point in history, but many Christians still say no, they cannot be leaders because the Bible says no in like two places. Is that a good answer? Is that how the Bible is supposed to shape our ethics today? This video argues that to refuse to disagree with the Bible on anything simply because it's in the Bible is already in disagreement with the Bible because that itself is not the Bible's stance on how it shapes our ethics. And it's definitely not the stance of Jesus, or Paul, or Walter White. This is The Holy Shift Show. We explore spirituality as it relates to social policy, economics, questioning faith, and the Bible. If you missed parts one and two, their links are in the description. Part two claimed that the Bible is like an extended parable and does not necessarily endorse the ways that humanity responds to God or understands God. But like Jesus' parables, the Bible narrates a story that invites us to reflect on who we are and where we are in relation to God. Part one discussed the Bible's inspiration and stated that God did not dictate the Bible. The Bible is the result of interactions between God and human beings. Part of what humans bring to this interaction with God is human ideology. So the Bible is not only divine inspiration, it expresses human ideology as well. Even Jesus recognizes that sometimes the Bible says what it says because of human quote-unquote hardness of heart. Philosopher of religion Keith Ward helpfully states, It will be a great help in reading the Bible as a spiritual text if we can admit that there are some errors and some limitations of perspective in it that have been produced by the inability of the human writers to grasp the fullness of the love and mercy of the God revealed in Christ. Those errors and limitations do not undermine the witness of the Bible, taken as a whole and in the light of the life of Jesus, to the unlimited loving nature and purpose of God. Indeed, they can be a positive help in seeing how humans can grow and must continue to grow in understanding of God, how our understanding of God is never complete and final, and how God can use even the weak minds and hearts of men and women to convey a truth which is sufficient to unite us to God forever. Keith Ward's point is clear in the ways that Jesus' own disciples, who played major roles in the production of the New Testament, are still in need of much growth, like all of us. They ask Jesus if he wants them to call down fire from heaven on a town who didn't receive them, and it states simply that he rebuked them. Peter once rejected Jesus' message of costly, nonviolent action, and Jesus says to him, Get behind me, Satan. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Peter denies Jesus multiple times during Jesus' brutal trial, and Peter is scolded once by Paul for breaking table fellowship with others for racially motivated reasons. And these are the humans that God worked with to produce the Bible. Another feature of the Bible that shows Keith Ward's point is the diversity of its ethical positions. Before concluding that God is some kind of maniac based on passages like Deuteronomy 7.2, we must keep in mind that other voices in Scripture portray God quite differently. Like, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Or before we think God only cares about some ritual purity or religious performance, we must hear passages where God says, I despise your festivals and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like water, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And of course, it's vital to know that the Bible proclaims the person and life and unlimited love of Jesus to be the ultimate word of God to humanity, the fullest revelation of who God is to the world, and who God calls humanity to be, which is never-ending, compassionate, self-giving love. It is the whole of Scripture that functions to invite humanity to re-established relationship and partnership with God, not any of its parts isolated from the whole. And Jesus is the anchoring center of that holistic picture. The rest of this video explores ways that Jesus and then Paul connected Scripture with their ethics. Let's look at Matthew 12, 1-8. It says, At that time, 
Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when his companions were hungry? How he entered the house of God, and they ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him or his companions to eat, but only for the priests? But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. This is where Walter White comes in. If you haven't seen Breaking Bad, it's worth watching if you're an adult. Walter discovers that he may not have all the time left in the world to live and wants to leave plenty of money for his family to live on if he passes. As a high school teacher, that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. So for his family, he is willing to step out of line with the law for his understanding of love. Walter wants to love his family and that is a higher priority for him than the letter of the law. Jesus in this story shares a similar sentiment. But unlike Walter White, Jesus does not leave behind him a trail of absolute chaos and destruction. He leaves a trail of compassion and hope and life and love. In this story, Jesus' disciples are picking heads of grain because they are hungry even though it's the Sabbath. Work on the Sabbath, such as picking grain, which is essentially harvesting, was against the law. Some Pharisees, who were popular religious leaders at the time, see it and complain to Jesus that they're breaking the law. Pharisees often get a bad rap in Christian history and even in the Bible. But it's important to point out that they were earnestly seeking to serve God, to do what they thought was right, and to lead their communities in the ways of goodness and peace. And in fact, they had great reasons for being as strict about the Sabbath as they were. In the Bible, which Jesus himself shared, the Sabbath is baked into reality. In the story slash poem of Genesis 1, it was a day on which God rested, making rest an essential thread in the fabric of reality. It was the day on which people were called to rest, to reconnect with God and with one another. It was especially to be enacted as a day of rest for underprivileged people who had to constantly work to sustain a materially meager living. Indeed, Israel's memory of their enslavement in Egypt was a prime motivator for them to remember the Sabbath and the importance of rest. Even the animals are to be given rest on the Sabbath in Scripture. And even the land itself enjoys a Sabbath. So in the Sabbath, you have this image where all of creation is called to rest in God regularly. And God took this instruction seriously. It is given the most space out of all Ten Commandments. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but Jesus' defense of his disciples doesn't seem very strong. He basically says, yes, well, other people break the law too. He shares a story about David eating bread from the temple and sharing it with his men when they were running from King Saul. No one talks trash about David for this incident, so why are you trash talking my disciples? So what's interesting about Jesus' response is that he nowhere denies that they are indeed breaking the law. He seems to admit that yes, they're breaking the law and yet still defends their actions. What makes this even more confusing is that just a few chapters earlier in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus assures the crowds that he is not here to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So Jesus starts his ministry assuring people that he's not going to mess with the law or custom or tradition, and quickly starts messing with people's understanding of law and custom and tradition. I think Jesus gives us a clue about what he's trying to do when he says he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus believed law, custom, and tradition were good things, but he wanted to dig into the law to find the underlying principles that made the law and tradition good in the first place, to pull those out and say we should live by these, adapted to the needs of present circumstances. Jesus wanted to live completely in accord with God's gracious will, and Jesus could recognize that sometimes the letter of the law went against God's obvious desire, which is always and everywhere love of others. For Jesus, love is the principle at the heart of every good law and tradition and custom. There is not a higher or deeper principle than love, not even law, and indeed, not even life, as Jesus shows by giving his life in love for others. In other words, Jesus was willing to quote-unquote break bad, meaning break the law, if that was required for the deeper law of love. That's why he quotes a scripture to them from the prophet Hosea where God declares, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Sacrifice, of course, being ritual law. If love or mercy is ever in conflict with custom or law, 
The path to pursue is always love, according to Jesus. And love is not some gushy emotion in the Bible. Love is action taken for the holistic well-being of others, even if that action is costly. In fact, love is such a high principle for God that one author in scripture daringly claims that God is love. Other instances of Jesus stepping out of conventional lines for the purposes of love are when he brings healing to people on the Sabbath, when he shares meals with quote unquote sinners and tax collectors, when he disregards ritual hand washing to teach that dirt doesn't make us impure, but our own thoughts and actions can, when he offers the same lesson by declaring that it's not certain foods that make us impure, but sometimes our own hearts can, Jesus engaged with Samaritans, a somewhat rival community with rival traditions, and even told a parable where a Samaritan is the hero. He allowed a quote unquote sinful woman to anoint him. Jesus associated with and touched lepers. Once, Jesus was so emboldened that he even halted the economic and ritual activity of the temple itself to call out corruption in the religious political leadership. That's the one that sealed his fate of execution. Jesus knew that putting his finger on abusive power relations between people would cost him his life, and he did it anyway, because he saw love as a higher principle than life. In fact, for Jesus, love is the principle that actually leads to true life, which is why the story claims God raised him from the dead. Because love is life. Even death can't bury love. This principle that was at work in Jesus' ethic was also at work in Paul. Paul believed that to impose Jewish custom on others, even custom said to be God-given, in order to welcome them into the community, was fundamentally unloving and against the quote-unquote law of Christ. In 1 Corinthians, he talks about uniting with people where they were, even if they were outside the law, and that for him to take such a position was paradoxically within the law of Christ. Paul thought that adherence to a written law, some unchanging, immovable code, was always going to be stuck in the context from which it originated, and therefore not always able to guide every future context. For him, we need to be freed from the letter of the law so that we could fulfill the real purpose or the spirit of the law, which is love. He wrote things like, we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we are enslaved in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the written code and the letter kills but the spirit gives life and the one who loves another has fulfilled the law the commandments are summed up in this word you shall love your neighbor as yourself love does no wrong to a neighbor therefore love is the fulfilling of the law it should be clear from these few examples from jesus and paul that human relationships and humanity's participation in the powerful love of god unambiguously takes priority over the letter of the law in fact Love, which is not a mere emotion, but is action for the holistic well-being of all, is the fulfilling of the purpose of the law. So if we return to our question, can women be church leaders today? To answer no, because the Bible says no in like two places, that is a fundamental misreading of the Bible itself. It misses everything the Bible says about law, the purpose of the law, the spirit of God, the fact that God is alive in the present moment, and especially what the Bible says about love. The Bible says so is a completely illegitimate argument for the continuing oppression that exists in our churches to this day. To say women can't be leaders in the church because they are women and because the Bible says so with no other justifications, and what legitimate justifications could there be, is blatantly oppressive. And for that matter, excluding any demographics from leadership simply because of demographics is blatantly oppressive. So here's an ironic conundrum for fundamentalistic thinking that believes everything we do or don't do has to be based on the letter of scripture somewhere. To refuse to go against scripture in any context for any reason whatsoever just because it's in scripture is already to go against what scripture itself actually teaches. And more than that, goes against what Jesus himself taught and actually demonstrated numerous times. Paul also taught and demonstrated this reality of the spiritual life. In seeking to take the Bible seriously, fundamentalistic thinking ignores what the Bible teaches in this regard. More than that, Scripture's entire purpose of spiritual and social transformation is drastically subordinated to ordering life according to the letter of the Bible rather than the spirit of the infinitely loving Christ. This is not a life-giving position to take, according to Paul and Jesus. 
To take the Bible seriously, it seems we must be willing to say no to parts of it when needed, as we are shaped by the larger whole of the Bible, and as we pay attention to the needs of our own context and where humanity is in its development as a social species. Another takeaway from these brief examples of Jesus and Paul for thinking about ethics is how they apply to any customs we may feel attached to, even at the expense of others' well-being. For example, do we support economic and social policies simply because we think they are good for me, though we may be wrong, even if they are harmful on others? Do we continue to support certain policies because they are quote-unquote the way it has always been done or because they are quote-unquote the American way? To give allegiance to anything, nation or scripture included, above the spirit of the infinitely loving God revealed in Jesus of Nazareth is to reject him as the Lord of the church. It is to reject the very definition of faith itself. It is to decline God's invitation to reconciliation with God and the whole earth. In short, the ultimate law is love, action for the holistic well-being of all, even if such action is costly and or contrary to custom. That is the invitation to fullness of life that God offers the world. This whole video can be summed up in this one sentence. The immovable letter of custom kills, but the ever-flowing spirit of love gives life. Check out the suggested resources in the description below and related videos on screen. If you like this content, give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.